Good morning, folks. I wonder if we could uh, take our seats. Uh, apologies from up front. I cannot wear a mask, speak into a microphone, and read with my glasses at the same time. I'm just not up to that. And I'm sure everybody knows who wears glasses that masks and glasses don't go well together. So um, please excuse me for doing that. Um, just a hearty welcome to all of us assembled here at church this morning, and of course to everybody who's still watching on Zoom and who might be catching us later on a YouTube uh, clip of the meeting. Um, I want to just have a few announcements as we start, um, and I want to catch them in a sense in a, in a way of thank yous, because um, um, I think we have a lot to give thanks for. Despite the circumstances and everything else that's happened, we have a lot to give thanks for. And first of all, I want to give thanks to uh, the locks who are away. Stephen isn't, I see he stayed at home, but the rest of the family are enjoying a really well-deserved break down the south coast. And you know, during lockdown, it's been a, a tough time, and, and David, to a very large degree, has um, uh, withstood the, the hardness of it all. And really, he's come up trumps, and I just really want to say thanks to David and to his family for what they've done for us. I mean, his, um, <coughs> his devotions and the organizing of Sundays <coughs> excuse me, has been exemplary, and I really want to extend thanks to him. And by the same token, I want to extend thanks to Thomas Queen, who's been a tremendous help to us as well. Um, has been really inspiring in some of the messages he's brought and some of the devotions. And really, thanks to Thomas. And I'm sure at some stage you'll be watching uh, the YouTube clip of this morning. So thanks to you, Thomas, and to you, Paige. And I want to wish you all the best with your health recovery in America. <coughs> While we're talking about um, health issues, there are a number of folks in the church who... Um, I know would really appreciate our prayers. Now, I'm just going to read you a, a list of the folks who are struggling at the moment. It's not um, a, a complete list. There are more people than this. But these are folks who are pretty much on top of the list right now. Uh, I'm not going to go into the individual issues, but if uh, you want to know more, if you're touched by any of them in particular, come chat to me afterwards. But um, certainly everybody would appreciate your prayers. We've got quite a long list, folks. We've got Paige in the US, uh, Danny Bewalder, who lost her dear husband a week and a half ago, Graham Beggs, Ellie Quayle's dad, Sid Fincham, Craig Fincham's dad, Donnie Nolter, who's um, going to have a procedure most likely in the coming week, <coughs> Joan Byram, who had a, a knee replacement, and I hope she's getting better soon and the pain isn't too bad. Lisa Roos's mom, uh, Billy Rotz, David Watson, who is Jill Watson's brother-in-law, John Watson's brother, Ray Matthews, and Marty Ball. So there's a long list of folks who uh, would really appreciate and, and need our prayers, folks. Then carrying on with our list of thank yous, I want to thank Bev. Where's Bev? Oh, come with there. Bev Clancy. Oh, there she is. Serving again at the back. Bev, you've been a star. Thanks for your consistent support throughout. It's really appreciated. And then um, I just want to thank Reg and Kingsley as well, and neither of whom are with us today. They've been great supporters through this period. Um, and while I, I think of Kingsley, you know he leads our prayer ministry in the church. And we are, I just want to remind you that Tuesday nights is a prayer meeting, and it's going to continue on Zoom, 7 to 8 on a Tuesday evening. I really would encourage as many of you to join us. It's, a, it's been a wonderful time, and it's, it's been amazing how our prayer ministry has grown through lockdown. You know, in the past, when you have a prayer meeting in person here at church, we get sort of, I don't know, 8 to 10 people maybe. But on Zoom, we've had more than 20 very often sometimes 30 and more, and it's been a really good time. So I would encourage you, Tuesday evenings between 7 and 8. I want to thank the worship team, teams, worship people who've been involved in, in difficult circumstances, but who've pushed through. I see Leo there, 
I see Mark here. Who else do I see? Mike, you guys. Thanks, but especially to you, Mark. You've really put a heck of a lot of effort into it, and we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And more than that, Mark is not only going to lead us in worship this morning, but he's our preacher. And he's going to be preaching from the book of Haggai, which we're really looking forward to. It's a favorite book of mine in many ways, and we're really looking forward to some deep and meaningful truths from you, Mark. Then um, other things that I just want to announce. From next week, we are no longer going to be streaming live on Zoom, the Sunday morning service. <laughs> we can go up to 100 people, and you don't have to book from next week onwards. You will have to go through the procedure, though, of having your temperature taken, filling in our register, and those sorts of things. But we're really looking forward to coming back together as a, as a church and, and coming back together strongly. So that's from next week. Um, tea and coffee will be served from next week, and I think we have today as well. Um, if we're using the, the kitchen facilities, great. Thank you. Come again? Yeah, I guess so. But we're strong in Hilton, eh? Yeah, it is moist, and uh, but it's great, isn't it, that we've got a little bit of moisture coming down. We certainly need it, eh? Um, next week we'll be starting, restarting Uptown for the preschoolers. And I think today Sivian is here to take care of uh, the Sunday school kids. Wow. As well. Okay. Should I Thank hold the new, can you hold um, the orange button? I think that's about it for now. Do you want to hold the uh, one other thing David asked me to mention is that there's been quite a lot of work done on the website, and he's encouraging us all to, to visit the website and to, to see what's going on. He's going to use that as a means of communication going forward, and I think you'd be pleased by what has been done there. Okay, folks, I think that's about all. Can we just uh, commit the morning to the Lord? Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks. As, as I have thanked the folks in the body who've really stood by and, and stayed with us and are here this morning and those watching on Zoom, I want to give you thanks for every single person associated with Hilton Baptist this morning. Father, we give you thanks, most especially though for you. Um, Father, without you, what would we be? Thank you, Lord, for keeping watch over each one of us, over our loved ones and our families. <clears throat> and even in the tough times, Father, thank you above all else that you give us a hope and a future. That no matter what the circumstances are, you are there beside us and before us and in front of us. And we give you such thanks and praise for that this morning, Lord. Father, I want to commit every moment of this meeting to you. I want to commit Mark now as he leads us in worship. Bless him, Father, and bless each person here present and those that are watching through the media. So we commit this morning to you now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Hilton Baptist. Uh, this is my first time back in the flesh, so I hope my voice lasts for all the singing and the preaching, but we'll see. If I start to lip sync at the end, you'll know why. Um, it's good to be back in person. Uh, one thing I didn't clarify, Richard, are we are all allowed to sing this morning? All right. That's good to know, so it won't just be me by myself. In that case, shall we stand together and sing our first two songs?
worship his holy name. Sing like
Father, we would be reminded of your love for us, but you are not in control of our lives. We pray in our prayers this morning that God's will would be done. Pray as I pray. I pray, Lord, this morning as you, as your people, you are our faithful, unchanging God. You're the rock that holds us firmly when the storms rage around us. Thank you that we can rest in the knowledge of your sovereignty and in your loving care. So Lord, we ask for a deep sense of your presence on those of our loved ones who are ill. And we've heard this morning such a long list of folk from our congregation here at HBC. And we pray, Lord, that you would give skill and care to the medical personnel who are treating them. And would you, the great healer, bring them back to health. Then too, Lord, we pray for all our learners and teachers and students who have had such a difficult year. And as they approach exams, we pray that you would give them confidence and clarity of thought. We particularly pray for the learners in our Sidora Sunday School who have had so little schooling this year. And for others, like the Wright girls in Senegal who have missed out on exams for a whole year. Lord, we are thankful for the wisdom and, and the courage of our government during lockdown. Thank you for our health department. And as we look forward, we ask that you will, by your spirit, fill us at HBC with joy and with an overflowing exuberance to serve you, both in our church, but also in our daily lives. We long, Lord Jesus, that you would be honored in all that we do. And so now as we listen to, to your word, Lord, we pray that we might hear and that we might put it into practice in our lives because we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The reading is from Haggai. Please follow on your phone or in your Bible. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but you have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord God, Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains in ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. 
Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, and whatever the ground produces, on men and cattle, and on the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Jozak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord, their God, and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord, their God, had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josazak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month. In the second year of the king, on the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Josedak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josedak, the high priest. Be strong, all of you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. For I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. Uh, the offering will happen just now. Thank you. We've got two more songs to sing, so shall we stand and sing our this first uh, well-known hymn, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven, to His feet thy tribute bring, ransom
of the themes picked up at the end of that reading that Liz was reading there is of God's faithfulness. He tells the people of Israel, remember my covenant I made in Egypt. Remember how I led you out of, out of Egypt. Remember that I am a faithful God. Take up the offering, thank you. Can we just give can we just give thanks for the offering guys heavenly father um, it has just amazed me that throughout lockdown your folks the members of this community of faith here in hilton have kept incredibly generous with their giving and that despite very difficult circumstances for a lot of folks the giving of this church has remained constant and Father, I want to give you thanks for the amazing consistency and generosity of your people who serve you here. Father, thank you for what has been given today, what has been given throughout the six months of lockdown. And Lord, would you continue to, to just touch the hearts of the people who give so generously? And would your care go out amongst your people here too, Lord, just in recognition of their generosity? And Father, I pray for your guidance on those that administer the monies. 
that they would continue to use it wisely, Father, both for the continuance of this work and for the blessing of the people. So, Father, thank you. Bless this money, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Right, we hear further from Haggai and for, from God. In, we start at Haggai chapter 2, verse 10. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Ask the priests what the law says. If a person carries consecrated meat in the fold of his garment, and that fold touches some bread or stew, some wine, oil, or other food, does it become consecrated? The priests answered, no. Then Haggai said, if a person defiled by contact with a dead body touches one of these things, does it become defiled? Yes, the priests replied becomes defiled. Then Haggai said, so it, is, so it is with this people and this nation in my sight, declares the Lord. Whatever they do and whatever they offer, there is defiled. Now, give careful thought to this from this day on. Consider how things were before one stone was laid on another in the Lord's temple. When anyone came to a heap of 20 measures, there were only 10. When anyone went to a fine vat to draw 50 measures, there were only 20. I struck all the work of your hands with blight, mildew, and hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. From this day on, from this 24th day of the ninth month, Give careful thought to the day when the foundations of the Lord's temple was laid. Give careful thought. Is there yet any seed left in the barn? Until now the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree have not borne fruit. From this day on I will bless you. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I will shake the heavens and the earth. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of the foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers. Horses and their riders will fall, each by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take you, my servant, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. Testing. Testing, testing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's as far as I can go. When I uh, was in the UK, I was part of a little blues band uh, singing um, Stevie Ray Vaughan and things like that. And the blues band was called Obadiah and the Minor Prophets. I thought it was a suitable name for a blues band. Uh, more suitable, especially if you spelt prophets, P-R-O-F-I-T, then it, for blues, it is definitely minor prophets. Um, but it is to the minor prophets that we turn now for Haggai. Now, unless Haggai is one of your favorite books like Richard, let's be honest, how many of you struggled to find it when you had to turn to it? Yes, <laughs> for two reasons. One, it's the, one of the minor prophets, and we kind of know where they are roughly but not precisely where each book is. And two, Haggai is very short. It's two pages, so you can skip over it very easily. So if you don't know where Haggai is, go to Matthew, turn left by three books, you'll find Haggai. Um, now, Haggai, the, the book of Haggai happens roughly in the middle of the book of Ezra that we did last week. If you remember, Ezra is in two parts, what happened immediately after the return from exile, and then there's a break, and then what happens when Ezra returns. The book of Haggai is located in the middle of that break. 
between the original return of the exile and the coming of Ezra and his cronies later on. So let's just put it in some historical context. The people of Israel and of Jerusalem had been taken into exile in Babylon because of their covenant unfaithfulness. And 70 years later, God had arranged it so that the king of Persia who had conquered Babylon, King Cyrus, would allow the people of Israel to go back to Jerusalem and would not only allow them to go back, not only allow them to rebuild the temple, but actually pay for them to rebuild the temple. So God had punished the people by taking them off into exile, but God had fulfilled his prophecy in the prophets like Jeremiah to bring them back and allow the temple to be rebuilt. So the people of Israel come back to Jerusalem, and in the first half of Ezra, we see about the troubles that they face, the difficulties with the locals, and the difficulties in getting started. But eventually they start, start the work, emphasis on start. They start the work of rebuilding the temple. If this was a TV program, we would now have a little screen that would say 16 years later. So it's now 16 years later. King, the, king Cyrus has now departed. It is now King Darius who's the king. And this is when Haggai comes to prophesy to the people. And Haggai's prophecy is actually four prophecies given over the space of a couple of months. So it's a short little period of time, and he says four things to the people. And we actually don't know anything else about Haggai. We don't know whether he had, was one of the exiles who had come back from Babylon or whether he was one of the locals. We just know that there was a guy called Haggai who made these prophecies. So the first prophecy that Haggai gives to the people and when I say gives to the people, he actually tells Zerubbabel, who is the governor appointed by the Persian king to rule. Of, he's, he is a Jew himself, but he's been appointed to be the political ruler of the area. And Joshua, who's the high priest for the people who have returned. So Haggai goes to those two people and he gives this prophecy. He says, all you people, the, the people living in Jerusalem now, are now spending your time building fancy houses building paneled houses, it said in Neil's translation, while my temple has still not been completed. In fact, the state of, dis of uncompletedness of the temple is so great that Haggai calls it ruins. So even though back in the book of Ezra, we hear about how they started to build the temple, they obviously didn't get far at all because 16 years later, Haggai still describes the temple as being in ruins. There's nothing there to see. They haven't even, as we'll see, they haven't even properly laid the foundations. So maybe they got the architect in, got some idea of what they were going to do, and then stopped for some reason. They stopped because they were wanting to focus on improving their own prosperity and getting ahead with their own lives. The, the, ref, the reference to paneled houses is not that the people of Israel had just built themselves shelter. They had built themselves houses, and now they were improving them. They had their houses. Now they were adding on a stoop. They were also fiberglassing the pool. Maybe they were putting those little recessed lights that go into the, into the ceiling that come on when you clap. That's the kind of thing. They, this is not just their basic shelter. They had their basic shelter. Now they were making nice houses. And Haggai says to the people, you're spending all your time and effort upgrading your houses, giving yourself a nice top billing house, and yet my temple is in ruins. Why did you come back to Zion if not to rebuild the temple? Why did God bring the people back to Zion if not to rebuild his temple? If he just wanted you to live in a nice house, you could have stayed in Babylon. So the very reason that you came back, you haven't fulfilled. What's more, Cyrus, and this is not mentioned in Haggai, but I was just thinking that Cyrus and his successor Darius gave money to these people to build the temple. And the temple hasn't been built yet. Where's that money gone? Someone called Judge Zondo. I don't know what's happening there. <laughs> So that's, that's the first prophecy of Haggai to the people. You're prioritizing your own prosperity, your own wealth, and completely ignoring what God requires. And so what does Haggai point out to them? He says, no matter how much you're trying to become prosperous, you're failing. Your harvests are half of what you think they are. You earn money and then the money, you lose the money. You try and get food and wine and it's not, it's not satisfying you. Why is that? If you'll notice that all of that language about the failing harvests, the failing prosperity, that's all covenant language. That's God saying to the people, you are breaking my covenant. So I am not going to be fulfilling the blessings of the covenant. The, the, the covenant relationship is the people of Israel do this, God does that. And if the people of Israel are breaking this part of the covenant, they don't get the blessings that come from God for his part. So, so Haggai is saying that to the people, 
even your efforts to make yourselves prosper are failing because you're not fulfilling your covenant responsibilities. So what is that, the application of this first prophecy to ourselves? Well, I think it seems pretty clear. Where does God fit in our ranking of priorities in our life? Is God at the top of our list of priorities or does God come second or third or is he an afterthought? And an, an easy way to kind of think about where God is in our priorities is when it comes to allocation of our time and energy, where how readily do we dedicate time and energy to God and to God's purposes and to God's things and how readily do we allocate time and energy to our purposes and our things? How much of our lives is spent pursuing our own prosperity how much of our time is spent pursuing God's will and what God requires for us. Now, if I'm honest, I would say, hmm, that is a challenge because it's so easy to get on with our own lives Monday to Saturday and then for a little period of time on Sunday, you remember, oh yes, oh yes, God, and then back to work on Monday and back to your life and back to getting ahead. But the message of Haggai to the people is God must be the top of your priority. Why must God be the top of your priority? Well, first of all, it's a recognition of who God is and who we are. If we truly believe that God is the creator of the universe and that we are just a collection of bipedal homo sapien mammals, surely we should see from that relationship, creature, human to God, God should come first. So not putting God first is a failure to recognize who God is. It's a failure to recognize who we are. But look at what Haggai says. He says, if you were to be putting God first, if you were to be fulfilling your covenant obligations to God and rebuilding the temple in this case, then God would be blessing you. God would be making sure that all of your attempts to get ahead in life succeed. Your harvest would be fine. You would have it, your houses would be fine. So God is saying, if you put me first, then you can trust me to look after you. And that same sentiment was put very well and succinctly by a man 500 years after Haggai who said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and what he requires of you. Seek that first and trust God to sort out everything else. That man was Jesus, by the way, in the, in the book of Matthew. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and God will sort out everything else. So that's the challenge for us. Are we going to put God first? A, because he deserves it. But B, do we have the faith to put God first and trust him to sort out our lives? So that, that is the challenge of Haggai's first prophecy. And it is a challenging challenge, as I said, because it's, it's so easy to, to forget about God for large periods of our life. So perhaps practically we can be asking, how, where does God come in our allocation of daily time in terms of Bible reading, in terms of prayer, in terms of quiet time? Where does God come in terms of our willingness or lack thereof to come to church. I, mean, I suppose I'm preaching to the choir here. But how frequently do we find ourselves on a Sunday being like, um, well, um, there's a good movie on. Let me watch that rather. Are we saying we'd rather watch television or rather go to the park or rather sleep in than come to church, than come to worship God with his people? What does that say about our, our priorities and where God is? Now, I don't want to get legalistic about it. I'm not saying if, you don't, if there's one Sunday in the year that you don't come to church, then that's a problem. But if you find you have a pattern of regularly putting other things first and God being an afterthought, then perhaps we need to listen to this first prophecy of Haggai. A lot of us kind of think, perhaps if we were to visualize our lives, we see ourselves as the center, and God kind of orbits us and we expect him to help us when we need it, but we're the center and God does stuff for us. But that's the wrong way around. In our lives, it should be God at the center and we do things to serve him. The fact that God serves us at all is not because he ought to, but it's because he chooses to because of the nature of his character. So Haggai's first prophecy is a challenging one for us. Then Haggai moves on to a second prophecy the people of Israel hear his first uh, oracle and they are convicted by it. And Zerubbabel and Joshua decide, right, let's, it, let, let's get this temple built, let's do it. And they get the people together, they 
go and cut down trees, they do whatever they need to do. I'm not familiar with temple building, and they start building the temple. But the people start to notice, compare the temple that they're building now to the temple of Solomon, the previous temple that had been destroyed by the Babylonians. And I imagine they could still see some of the foundations and where it was. And just for interest's sake, the, the temple of Solomon was probably about half the size of a soccer field. The temple that they were building now was probably about the size of a tennis court. So it's, a, it's a quite a lot smaller than the original one. And there might even have been some people who had seen the previous temple, given that it was only, well, would have been 86 years prior. So they would have to be very old people with very good memories. But maybe their parents or their grandparents had told them about what the previous temple was like. And that now as they're building the new temple, they're becoming aware that this temple is nothing compared to the previous one. And the people start to become a bit dis discouraged and downhearted, like, oh, we're putting all this effort in now for such a tiny temple. And what is Haggai's word to them? He says, do not be discouraged, for I am with you. This is what God says. Don't be discouraged. I am with you, and I am going to do great things, and I am going to make a new temple that is far greater than the old one. So what is that application for us? Well, first of all, let's just think about this new temple that Haggai says that God is going to make. Haggai says, Haggai reports God saying, I am going to make a new temple that is much greater than the old one. It's clearly not this temple that they're currently building, which was a lot smaller. You might say, well, maybe it's Herod's temple, which about 400 years later, Herod built a temple that was huge. It was three or four times bigger than Solomon's temple. So maybe you might say it was that one. But I think what this prophecy is pointing towards is the temple that became flesh, the temple that was torn down in three days and rebuilt, and that is Jesus himself, that God is saying, I am building towards a temple that is a person, and that person is me in human form. Because what is the significance of the temple? The significance of the temple is that it is the, sim the symbol of God's presence with his people. It's the symbol of where God is amongst his people. It's in the center of Jerusalem. It's in the center of his people. It's symbolic of God being with his people. It's symbolic of the glory of God. Back in those days, people judged the gods of the nations on the prestige of the nation. So a powerful nation must have had a powerful God and a weak nation must have had a weak God. So having some sort of temple was some sort of indication of the prestige of God. Now, if we look at Jesus as the ultimate temple, Jesus is the ultimate symbol of God's presence with us. Because in Jesus, God became present with humanity forever. Because in Jesus, God became a human and remains to this day a human. Jesus didn't stop being a human after the resurrection. To this day, there is a human sitting at the right hand of, the, of God the Father, interceding on behalf of his people. So Jesus is the ultimate temple because he's the ultimate symbol of the presence of God with humanity. Furthermore, through Jesus, the Holy Spirit is now available to all of us. So we are now able to have the presence of God in our lives right here, right now. What, how does Paul describe human beings in Corinthians? He says, don't you know, you are the temple. Your bodies are the temple of God. So we now, through the Holy Spirit, we now have God present in us we now are the presence of God amongst the people. So this is the temple that Haggai is pointing forward to. He's saying, don't be discouraged, people of Jerusalem. What you are doing is building towards this great new temple where God will make his presence known amongst humans forever, where God's presence will become personally present in the lives of billions of people. Is that not a greater temple than the temple of Solomon? It surely is. And the temple was also a symbol of God's prestige and God's glory and God's power. And how much more prestige and glory and power is there than there is in Jesus? Because in Jesus on the cross, all of God's enemies were defeated. Paul tells us that he made, that, that Jesus on the cross made all of God's enemies a footstool for God, completely defeated them and destroyed them. So how much of a greater temple is Jesus than the, than the temple of Solomon? That's why God says to the people, don't be discouraged. This is what I'm working towards. So the application for us is in our daily lives, as we are trying to work out God's will in our lives, we might be feeling discouraged. Maybe you've got a family member that you've been praying for and for years and nothing. Maybe you in your workplace are trying to be a witness, trying to minister and nothing, or it seems to you to be nothing. Maybe you're Kent and Robin and you were supposed to be in Indonesia in 
July this year, and he's still in Hilton. The message of Haggai's second prophecy to us, or maybe he was supposed to be in the US and nothing. Um, maybe Haggai's message of, to us is don't be discouraged, for God is with us, and God is working a great thing. We might not be able to see how our little part fits into the greater whole, but don't be discouraged because God is working a great thing through us and through his people. Paul in, in Corinthians talked about how the church is a victory procession for God over God's enemies. So even though it might not feel like it, we sit here and we see 30 or 40 people on a misty day and you might think, what are we achieving here? Don't be discouraged because God is working a great thing through his people. So that's Haggai's second prophecy. Then Haggai, a couple of months later, moves on to a third prophecy. And this prophecy is slightly different in its format to the others. He asked the priests now a couple of rhetorical questions. What do you get when you cross a joke with a rhetorical question? That's the joke, by the way. <laughs> so Haggai asked the priests some questions. He says, if you have consecrated food and you're carrying it in the fold of your garment, I don't know why they would do that, but there must be some reason. But they're carrying consecrated food from the altar in the fold of their garment, and you touch something else. Does that make something else consecrated? And the priests say no. Then Agai says, if you touch a defiled object, such as a dead body, does that make you now defiled? And the priests say yes. Now, I think that's clear for us if you, if you think about it in these terms. If you are dirty and you touch something clean, does it make you clean? No. If you are clean and you touch something dirty, does it make you dirty? Yes. So that's what, that's what Haggai's trying to get across to the, the people of Israel and their priests. And then he says, and so shall it be with the people. So because your lives are defiled, your actions for God are defiled. That's what Haggai says. Your, and, and your purity is not conferred by proximity. So just because you happen to live near God's temple doesn't make you more pure or more consecrated than people who don't. And just because you might be doing good things for God, if your life is defiled, those good things that you're doing for God are defiled too. So what is the message of this prophecy for us? Well, I, again, I think it's pretty clear. First of all, our purity is not gained by proximity. So just coming to church doesn't make us righteous. Just being near Christian people doesn't make us righteous. Having Christian parents doesn't make us righteous. The only thing that can make us righteous is a specific act of consecration, and that specific act of, of consecration was the death of Jesus Christ and his subsequent resurrection for our sins. And it is only by our faith in that that we can become righteous. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians, Jesus took our sins so that we might, might share his righteousness. That is the only thing that can make us righteous. No amount of doing good deeds, hanging out with good people, looking holy in church, saying poetic prayers, none of that will make you righteous. But on the other hand, if our lives are defiled, if our hearts are wicked, then that is going to defile all the good things that we try to do. So if you are giving a good appearance of being Christian and being godly and coming to prayer meetings and... Um, you know, giving to the poor and saying profound sounding prayers and wearing a WWJD bracelet, not that anyone wears any of those anymore. If you're doing all of that, but in your heart you are wicked, then all of those actions are ruined. So I think that is, is a pause for us to stop and think what is the state of our heart. Now, obviously, if we take the New Testament into account, the Haggai is not suggesting that we can all be perfect. And certainly the New Testament wouldn't suggest that we must first be perfect before we can serve God because the, the gospel is a gospel of grace where God forgives our sins, but God also knows the condition of our hearts. He knows what we desire and what we want and what we really are inside. So if we are, if we, if we are really trying to serve God and we sin, God forgives us. 1 John says, if we confess our sins, God will keep his promise and do what is right. He will forgive us our sins and purify us of all wrongdoing. So if we are dedicated to serving and following Jesus, God has our sins covered. But if deep in our hearts we are wicked and we actually just care for ourselves and actually don't care about God, then no matter what kind of holy-looking actions you do, they will be defiled. 
So that is the challenge of Haggai's third prophecy for us. Then Haggai goes on to a fourth prophecy, which is kind of a strange one. He talks to Zerubbabel, who is the governor of Jerusalem, and he talks about how Zerubbabel, in, in the original translation, will be given the signet ring, that Zerubbabel will become God's signet ring, and that God will bless Zerubbabel, and through Zerubbabel will bless the people. And then God uses a whole lot of um, messianic, apocalyptic language about the empires will be overthrown and all the chariots will be destroyed, etc., etc., etc. And that's his, that's his fourth prophecy. Now, a couple of interesting points here. The, the reference to the signet ring, most commentators think it is a reference back to, in the book of Jeremiah, so Jeremiah was before... The, well, part of Jeremiah was before the exile. While the people of Israel and Jerusalem were being very evil and wicked, Jeremiah was prophesying that they're going to be punished, they're going to be punished. And he says to one of the kings, Jehoiakim, I think is how you pronounce it, he says, God had says to you, King Jehoiakim, who was a bad king, he says, even though you are my signet ring, I now take you off my finger and throw you away. Now, a signet ring for a king was a symbol of their authority and of their power. And if you, if, you see, if you have the king's signet ring, you can seal letters, and that letter then carries the authority of the king. So this is God saying to Jehoiakim that you were my signet ring, now I throw you off, was saying you were acting with my authority. The kings, David's descendants were kings of a dynasty that were blessed by God, who had, were acting with God's authority, that were speaking on behalf of God. But now, because of their wickedness, God kind of, um, annuls that contract. He takes the signet ring off and throws it away. Here we find a hundred years later, God is saying to Zerubbabel, now you become my signet ring again. So it's God reaffirmed because Zerubbabel was a descendant of King David. He was in the Davidic line. And this is God saying to Zerubbabel, now I'm restoring my promise to the Davidic dynasty that I'm going to work through the kings who are the descendants of David. So now, even though I cast off your ancestors through Zerubbabel, now we can re-enter that relationship where you again are my signet ring. You again speak with my authority and you uh, represent me. And as, as a matter of historic fact, of all the empires, the big empires, I should say, that were predominant in the time of Haggai, Persia and Egypt, and the ones recently eclipsed Syria and Babylon, within 200 years, none of them existed. So in a direct sense, the prophecy about all the empires of the earth being overturned actually did happen. Alexander the Great, who at this stage, Greece was a tiny little uh, afterthought that no one cared about. And within a couple of years, they had conquered the Persian Empire, they had conquered Egypt. All of these empires had been overturned. So in one sense, there was a small direct fulfillment of this prophecy um, fairly soon after this. But in another sense, it's pointing to a bigger, a much bigger thing. Again, it's, it's pointing to Jesus. There is going to come a time when there, there will be a break in history where all the empires of evil, all the ways that the, the powers of the evil one use, has all the, let's try that again, all the power that the evil one has over the people of earth will be broken through Jesus. That Jesus and the gospel is going to overturn the way the world works. So what Haggai is saying to the people here is have hope. Things are going to happen in the future that are going to make everything we're doing now worthwhile. Have hope because God is going to work a great thing. God is going to change the world. So whatever you're doing now, do it with hope. And so that's our application from, from, the, from the fourth prophecy. Live our lives keeping at the front of our mind the hope that we have in Jesus the hope that we have knowing that our sins are forgiven, knowing that we are in a righteous standing with God, knowing that when, Jesus look, when God looks at us, he doesn't see our sinfulness, he sees Jesus' righteousness. But more than that, we live with the hope of God's second coming. Now, the word hope in the English language doesn't quite mean what it meant to the, the writers of the Bible. Now when we say hope, we kind of mean wish. I hope I win the lottery. I mean, I wish I win the lottery. 
but in the, in the biblical sense, when we say hope, it's something we're certain is going to happen. That's why we are peaceful and content now, because we know something's going to happen. Imagine you, your car breaks down. I think I've used this analogy before, but your car breaks down in the middle of the night, out in the middle of nowhere, but you've got a friend who's uh, a gifted mechanic, and you phone them up and you say, hey, Gareth, can you come and help me with my car? It's broken down. And Gareth says, great, I'll be there in 15 minutes. Then I have hope. I don't worry because I have hope because I know my friend is coming and he's going to sort it out and everything is wrong with my car will be sorted out. That's the hope that the Bible is talking about. It's not a vague wish that maybe someone will come and help me. It's a knowledge that someone is coming is going to save the day. That is the hope that we have. It's not a vague wish that, some, that everything will be all right in the end. It is, a, it is living in peace and contentment now because we know that God will return, that Jesus shall come again and every wrong shall be righted, every tear shall be wiped out of every eye and that we shall live in the presence of God forever. That is the hope that we must keep in our minds throughout our daily life, especially in a year like this year where things have gone a little bit askew, a little bit asconce. We keep in our minds and in our hearts the hope that we have in Jesus, that Jesus will return that God will work everything out for the good of those who love him. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, these prophecies of Haggai are, are challenging, they're convicting, but they're also encouraging. We pray firstly, Lord, that you would help us to put you first in our lives, that you would help us to prioritize you, that you would help us to have faith that if we prioritize you, that you will look after us. We pray that you will give us practical and workable ways that we can change things in our lives to put you first. Lord, we also pray that we will not be discouraged in our daily life, that we will keep working in the knowledge that you are with us. And we also pray that uh, if, there, if there are any actions in our lives that are defiling our work for you, that through your Holy Spirit, you will convict us of those sins, that you will point them out and that we might be able to repent of them and that you might be able to purify us of them. And we pray finally, Lord, that you will stir in up the hope of glory and the hope of our life in eternity with you so that throughout our daily lives, we will be motivated by that. We pray all of these things in your mighty name. Amen. Right, we've got one more song. This final song is a bit of a new song. It was only written last year, but it does declare the hope that we have in Jesus. It's called, What Gift of Grace is Jesus My Redeemer? Let us stand together. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more in heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness, my freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. If you would like to speak to me or ask me questions or if you'd like to come up for prayer, you can come to me, you can come to Richard, you can come to Mike or Neil or whoever you wish. May God be with you and do have a good rest of the day.